Greetings, it is I, Tantus Nam and Jacobin, Lord and Emperor of the Jacobin Empire, and welcome! It is time to continue my discussion on the history of Magic the Gathering, where I go set by set, release by release, and give you information about each and every one of them. So today for you, I have a supplemental set that introduced a new style of gameplay, Plane Chase 2009. So of course, just like its name, it was released on 2009, the exact date being, of course, September 4th. Two big concepts that this system introduced to you was our Planes cards, which I will talk about in depth what a Planes card is, and the idea of planeswalking between different planes over the course of the battle. So this was really made to be more of a multiplayer format than anything, and the big oversized plane cards this is going to be an important part of this, because each of these planes cards that was within the set not only represented a different plane, it represented a location on that plane. So you could find that there are multiple planes cards each representing a different location on the same plane. You could have like three different cards. They're all the same plane. They're just different places there. So the product itself was sold in specialized packs for about $20 each at the time. Each of them contained a 60 card deck, a standard for a lot of decks sold kind of standard, uh, standard uh, supplemental systems, 10 of the oversized playing cards, a special planar dice, which I'll explain how that works when I talk about the system itself, and of course the normal inserts that you usually get. So the set overall had approximately 240 cards to it and 40 planes cards. Though that's not exactly true. There was technically 41 planes cards because on the very weekend that this came out on, you had the generalized release of... You had a special event, a release event, and they had a planes card from Zendikar showing off the new plane and new set to be coming very soon after here. That is another important thing to talk about here. The fact is, within these 60 cards, which, noting, I said there was 240 total, it was 148 different cards, including putting all the lands down into one type of card, eight of every set were rare. And every set had a card from the Zendikar set in it. That means every one of these sets, four in total, there's four cards in total, had a card that previewed Zendikar. So we already have, if you got all of these right before Zendikar out, guess what? You'd have a play, well, you, unless you went to the release event, you wouldn't have the planes card, but you might have it. It's, it's a promo. But you would at least have four cards from Zendikar before it came out. You're ahead of the curve. The point of this set was to simulate planes walking and to show that there was effects of planes. So there's two major elements to the entire idealism of planes chase. The planes chase dice and the planes cards themselves. Let's talk about each. The dice itself is a six-sided dice. Four of the sides are blank. One of the sides has, this little, has a symbol that represents planes walking. It's the um, fork kind of symbol. The other one is this kind of circle with a line through it that represents chaos. Now, at the start of a Planes Chase game, you set everything up as normal. Again, this is more, it's better in multiplayer format. Everybody gets their own decks. Everybody plays with whatever deck you want at the time. Uh, you take whatever your deck is appropriate to the format you're really playing, if it's specifically Planes Chase, or if you're playing Modern or whatever. You're playing it with Planes Chase too. You take the Planes Chase deck of planes, you shuffle up the deck of planes you got, however many planes you got in there, which, I mean, I guess you could have repeats, you might not have repeats. It's whatever you want to build as a plane chase deck. Anyway, at the beginning of the game, first player flips one over. Each plane has two effects at it. It has a static effect. Something that just activates as long as the plane's around. The plane's around, this is what's going on. This is what's affecting every player. And then it has a chaos effect. If on that dice, chaos is rolled, this happens also. This activates. And that's where it comes down to the dice roll. Because not only have my planes, which I flipped out, I have the dice. On my turn, I get to roll the dice once for free. I get to roll the dice. What happens? Do we change planes? Do we get chaos? Does nothing happen? We find out. 
I can then roll as many times as I want as I can use for mana. Here's how it works. The first time I roll, free. Second time I roll, costs me one mana. The next time after that, two, then three, then four, etc, etc. And it keeps getting more and more expensive to roll the dice. But as long as I have the mana to do it, it means I can roll the dice infinite times if I have infinite mana. Or if I have a hundred, I couldn't think off the top of my mad math to do that, but it's a lot of rolls. <laughs> it's a lot of rolls. You know, it, it builds up quickly the amount of mana you require to roll this dice again and again. You have a two in six chance of something happening, a one third chance of something happening. It might mean you might not roll anything with the amount of times you roll. It might mean you change planes. It might mean you get the chaos. And that's where the essence of the game comes in. It's a extra random element that hits everyone. Because this plane here might have a general effect that hurts everyone. Or it might help one player. Or the chaos might particularly help me, then it would help everyone else. Maybe if I roll that chaos, I get a big advantage on my turn. I don't guess I roll again and we plane ship away so no one else can get it. There's a lot of various reasons and effects behind the plane chase format and why it's interesting. It definitely does pertain better to multiplayer, of course, but it is an interesting random element you're adding into the entire game. Changes things around a little bit. Now there were four decks, as I said. The first of the decks was a green one, red one, called Elemental Thunder, and it had a very well elemental focused. Red and green elementals, it had a focus on bringing out, creating tokens, things like that, manipulating elementals. Metallic Dreams was a rainbow deck that's all five colors and it was an artifact based deck. So we had artifacts that not only were every color but used every color and of course you had a lot of very powerful artifact cards in there that I'm going to talk about when I dive into the cards in this set. There was a white red one called Strike Force which was all about speed, first strike, burning things away. It was very Boros. <laughs> If you know anything about how Bur Boros decks is a traditional kind of Boros deck of like speed, soldiers, crushing forth, double, uh, double strike, a lot of stuff like that, that pertains a lot to the mixtures of red and white very well. It's a classic kind of red and white combination deck. And the last one, which may I note if you're still looking to buy these intact, is the most expensive one. As someone that bought all four intact is Zombie Empire. Pure black, it's a zombie deck. Plain and simple. It's a black zombie deck. Now we should talk about some of the actual cards from this set because that's one of the more important things is it's cool that there's all these sets out there. Let's talk about some of the cards from it. First off, we have a Chroma's Vengeance. Destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. The big thing here is you could cycle it. Meaning if you don't need a board wipe and you need a card instead, go ahead and cycle it. It would cost you three colors to do so. There's Arc Lightning. Now this did three damage, but the important part about Arc Lightning is it could be divided between one, two, or three different target creatures or players. Meaning I could do one damage to three different targets, two damage to one target, one damage to the other, or three damage to a single target. My choice on how I'm going to divide up this three damage. Very good in case you need some choices in what your actions are. There's also Ascendant Evancar. A favorite I've always liked, he's a flying creature, and other black creatures get plus one, plus one. Other non-black creatures get minus one, minus one. So it makes all your black creatures bigger and your everything else smaller. Great in a pure black deck. There is Balefire Liege. Other red creatures get plus one, plus one. Other white creatures get plus one, plus one. When I cast a red spell, I do three damage to target player. When I cast a white spell, I gain three life. So if I cast a red and white spell, I only do three damage to a player, I also gain three life. Balefire Liege is really, really great in a red-white deck. He, it really is. Beacon of Unrest. Return target artifact or creature from a graveyard, any graveyard, to the battlefield under your control. So I could bring back an artifact or creature from my own graveyard for, or from any of my opponent's graveyards, put it into play. Beacon of Unrest gets shuffled into my library afterwards. So not only do I get something back, I get to keep Beacon of Unrest. Bosh! Iron Golem! It has Trample. For three colors and a red, I can sacrifice another artifact. Bosh deals damage equal to that artifact's converted mana cost to target creature or player. 
I effectively can then just use boss, get rid of other artifacts I don't need, and depending on what its converted mana cost is, whack it into something else. Deal some damage. Browbeat. Any player may have Browbeat deal five damage to them in order to basically counter what Browbeat does. If no player has Browbeat do five damage to them, I can draw three cards. So it's, I play it and be like, does anyone want to take five damage? <laughs> no, I'll take my three cards. Cobalt Coffers. This is a great one if you're playing straight black because tap two, tap it, add a black mana to your mana pool for each swamp you control. The more swamps you have, the more mana. So this means that at two swamps, you're breaking even for the amount of mana you get. It's not really great. You're technically tapping three lands. At three swamps, you're tapping three lands to get three mana. You're completely even. At four, you're starting to make a comeback that your lands to tapping equal more mana. Then there's Congregate. Target player gains two life for each creature on the battlefield. That means you look at every creature out there. That's why this is really good in a multiplayer game because you have a whole lot of players with a whole lot of creatures. And whoever you want to gain this life gains two life for each of those creatures. So it could be you. It could be someone else if it's more appropriate. Can happen. Corpse Harvester. For a colorless and a black, tapping it, sacrifice a creature. Search your library for a zombie card and a swamp. Reveal the two, put them in your hand, shelf your library afterwards. So I get rid of something else in play, including a token, and I get a zombie and a swamp from my deck. That could be really good. Dark Steel Forge. Artifacts you control are indestructible. Bam, simple, great, wonderful. The Dark Steel Forge is a must for any modern or legacy or vintage artifact deck. Highly recommend it. It was right here in this deck. One of the reasons this was actually a really good artifact deck they included in here. This is the main reason. Death Baron. Skeletons and other zombies you control get plus one, plus one, and death touch. It's great in a zombie deck because it is a zombie. But if you really wanted to make a skeleton deck, it's also good. Skeletons, which oftentimes have regeneration, now have also death touch. Very mean. Fabricate. Search your library for an artifact card, reveal it, put it in your hand. Fabricate's great because it's not expensive and I get anything from my deck, any artifact. Fertilid. It's technically a zero, zero creature, but it comes into play with two plus one plus one counters in it, so it doesn't die right away. But for a colorless and a green, I can remove a plus one plus one counter from Fertilid, search my library for basic land card, put it into play tapped. So I can effectively place a Fertilid out kill it, get rid of it eventually, and get lands in its place. If I have some way of bringing it back, which I'm not sure if they have it in their elemental deck, but if I did, I can keep getting lands with it. Forgotten Ancient, another elemental. Whenever a player casts a spell, put a plus one plus one counter on Forgotten Ancient. So it gets really big when anybody casts spells. Multiplayer game, lots of spell casting, getting really big fast. Here's the big caveat. At the beginning of your upkeep, you may move any number of plus one plus one counters from Forgotten ancient to other creatures so i then make it big with all the spells you're casting and distribute it to everything else i control so i don't have what's one big really really big gigantic massive huge creature i have a bunch of relatively big creatures furnace of wrath when a source deals damage to a creature or player double that damage furnace of wrath just makes everything burn quicker goblin offensive for X mana, put X 1-1 one, one red goblin creature tokens onto the battlefield. I love goblin offensive. It's a great way of getting a whole crap ton of goblins out fast. Grave Pact. When a creature you control is put into the graveyard from play, each other player must sacrifice a creature. So when one of my things dies, everybody gets something that dies. It's a black deck. I can sacrifice creatures. So I can have, let's say, zombie tokens, which I sacrifice. I don't need them. And in return, everybody also gets rid of stuff. I weed down their creatures by getting rid of mine. And maybe if I have tokens, I don't matter too much. I'm, I have plenty of creatures to go around. Helldozer. Three black mana. Tap. Destroy target land. If that land was a non-basic land, untap Helldozer. I can use him again. So he's really great at destroying non-basic lands and even one basic land a turn. Insurrection. Untap all creatures. Gain control of all creatures until end of turn. They gain haste. 
I basically steal everything on the board and can do with what I want with them. Insurrection is very expensive, but it's a, it's a game winner. That's the best way of describing it. A game winner. Lightning Helix. Does three damage to target creature or player? You gain three life. Standard white-red spell. Really good one. Luxodon Warhammer. A piece of equipment with equip cost three. The equipped creature gets plus three, plus O, oh, lifelink, and trample. So not only does it smack for more damage, it tramples over, and you gain life. Mage Slayer. Another equipment. Equip three also. When equipped creature attacks, it deals damage equal to its power to the defending player. Meaning, even before it does its combat damage, it smacks the defending player just by attacking. If I would say, let's say, have a forgotten ancient with a billion counters on it that's over a 2020, and I put the mage slayer on it, attacks someone with only 20 life, so that they take 20 damage instantaneously and die before they can even block forgotten ancient, well, Master of Ethereum. It has power and toughness equal to the number of artifacts you control, and other artifact creatures get plus one, plus one. It's relatively one of the best artifact power toughness creatures because it gives a boost to all your other artifact creatures. Perfexian Arena. At the beginning of your upkeep, you draw one card, lose one life. This is one of those times that if you are willing to sacrifice a little bit of your life, especially if you have already drained some life away from people, you know, and gained a little extra, you get more cards. Raza, Boros Archangel. It's a Flying Vigilance Haste. The next two damage that will be dealt to target creature you control is dealt to a different creature. Effectively, I take two damage that will be dealt to this creature I own and redirect it anywhere else. Another one of my creatures, one of my opponent's creatures now takes damage. The creature that just attacked me deals to deals the damage to itself. Maybe a smaller creature on my end can block and kill it now. Relentless Assault. Untap all creatures that attacked this turn. After this main phase, there's another combat phase, followed by an additional main phase. Effectively, what it means is, if I attack with a bunch of creatures, they get to untap. Remember, it's not all creatures you control untapping, it's all those that attacked. They can attack again. Simple as that. It gives you new, technically two combat phases, if things activate during the combat phases. Rolling Thunder. Does X damage divided by, amongst any number of creatures or players? I like it as a burn spell because it just does an X spell, but I can divide it how I wish amongst everything. One of the reasons I like it. Skeleton Shard. For a three colors tap or one black and tap, return target artifact creature from your graveyard to your hand. It gets back artifact creatures. Maybe I was chucking stuff with Bosch. I get it back, put it back out, chuck it with Bosch again. Hmm. Sludge Strider. When another artifact enters the battlefield, or another artifact leaves the battlefield, means enter or leave, I may pay one colors and target player loses one life, I gain one life. That means as I put artifacts into the battlefield, I can gain life and siphon it from another person, and they leave it. Meaning not only creation, but sacrificing them. Especially if I'm doing things like with artifact tokens. Create token, leave token. Or there's Pentavis, which I'm not going to talk about today because I didn't feel like it, but it creates tokens, or it turns those tokens back into plus one plus one counters so as i pop them in and out i can also pay mana and drain you from life until you're dead lots of combos with that soul warden when other creature enters the battlefield you gain one life it's anywhere anybody summons a creature tokens whatever summons them you gain life undead war chief zombie spells you cast cost one colorless less to play and zombie creatures you control get plus two plus one including itself so Rather than say other, it includes itself, so it gets plus two, plus one, and effectively goes from a one, one to a three, two from its own effects. Though if you could somehow cancel its own effects until end of turn or something, it would no longer get that bonus. That's, I guess, kind of why they include that. Vernet Force is a seven, seven, that at the beginning of each upkeep, create a one, one green sapling creature token. That means in a big multiplayer game, well, let's say you got five people, one, two, three, four, Five saplings on my turn. Oh, I've done my turn. Another five saplings. Another five saplings. The number of players you have are the number of saplings you already get and have at the during your upkeep. Basically, by that time, that's how many you're getting. It creates a lot of saplings on your side of the board. But that's it for today. So I introduce you to Planes Chase, 2009, technically. This is actually one of my favorites, and I love playing Planes Chase.
They've only actually had two releases of Plane Chase so far. I'm hoping they'll have more. But the Plane Chase sets have always been a really big favorite because I've loved, well, playing them. I find them interesting. It's a unique format that adds a new level. You know, one of the things about Magic decks is oftentimes money and rares can make a difference. And one of the things about Plane Chase is it's such a random element, it can actually completely alter things. I could play with a very popper heavy deck, or just a deck that doesn't have a lot of rares, and versus my friend there that might have spent a lot of money on their deck and have a huge ton of rares in it, maybe even all rares. That plane might make the difference between me having an advantage over them. And that's why I love Plane Chase, because it never know what kind of advantage or disadvantage it's going to throw your way, how it's going to affect the game. So more random than just playing with a deck you designed yourself. But anyway, I hope you're having a great day. If you have played Plane Chase before and have some interesting decks you've made specifically for Plane Chase, let me know in the comments below. Love to hear your stories about some awesome Plane Chase games. But regardless, until the next time, I bid you farewell.